Hey everyone. So a question comes up with some regularity for me. Uh, whenever people get into firearms and they say, look, I really want to be more involved in this community. I want to support this community. I want to support guns and gun rights. But the NRA is kind of a trash fire. Is that right? I'm, anytime someone asks me, I'm like, oh, oh yeah, they're a steaming pile of poo. Like, don't go anywhere to freaking near the NRA. But, you know, does that mean you just can't be involved in a greater organization? You can't be part of efforts that are coordinated? No, it uh, doesn't mean that at all. So if you want a list of resources, and people ask me for this kind of list all the time, right, there are places you can reach out. You've got the Second Amendment Foundation. They're kind of small, but they're scrappy. They do all the things the NRA kind of is supposed to do and doesn't. You have Gun Owners of America, Alan Gottlieb's group, uh, kind of reactionary, but they are a force, man, in the court systems. They are getting it done. Uh, you also have the Firearms Policy Coalition, right? Again, these are all groups that kind of do what the NRA says their mission is without being, you know, a steaming turd heap that is just stealing everyone's money and getting nothing done. Now, if more progressive politics are your bag, if you don't feel that the gun community should be made up exclusively of sort of right-wing, cishet white guys, again, like plenty of outlets out there that you can get involved with. Uh, the John Brown Gun Club shows up in a lot of people's videos. They're usually affiliated with like whoever your local anarchist or mutual aid collective is. You can check them out, right? Uh, if you're not familiar with Piper and the work of Armed Margins, LGBTQ firearms rights, remember guns are a minority issue. They are a gay issue. They are a trans issue. Anybody speaking of underrepresented minorities who doesn't know Latino Rifle Association, lots of local chapters there, right? Uh, NAGA, National African American Gun Association. You do not have to be black to join them. You do not have to be Latino to join the Latino Rifle Association. If you're not familiar with even like Defense Distributed's group, Legio, they, they are, again, like small groups can get things done. And in many cases, it's your small local groups where you can find more traction and more connection with people like you. Get on Reddit. Look for your local like gun owners, you know, gun shooters meetup. Uh, like, you know, Wah Guns. Washington Guns is just a Reddit group that talks about, yes, places to go out into the Pine Barrens and shoot rocks, or they talk about, hey, when are we going to go down to Olympia and meet at the State House? Look for your local groups and chapters because they are out there. Making connections to others matters. And as part of all of that, one of the biggest voices when it comes to politics that are not your sort of Fox News, alt-right kind of chud gun groups uh, is the Liberal Gun Club. They are arguably one of the biggest, if not the biggest group out there working for expansion of and maintaining of all appropriate firearm rights because these are an issue that's, that really affects people who don't look like me way more. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Liberal Gun Club and the work they are doing, I encourage you to check it out. Of course, links to all the groups I'm mentioning are down in the doobly-doo below. But this video is about an interview I did with the LGC. Uh, they had a really cool session where they asked me a bunch of questions. I am a member. They, somebody gifted me a membership, and it was a very cool gesture. One of the viewers out there in Internet land, I thank you. And I'm going to re-up because I've liked everyone I've met. Uh, on their Zoom meetings, on their Discords. If you're not familiar with the huge teaching and resource channel that they have, the Bench Doctor and a lot of safety and awareness sessions, they get together, they put it all out there for free. Uh, so again, just find groups that match your energy and if they are involved in firearms in a way that you think uh, you can respect and you can like, get involved. That is one way or another the answer to anything you care about in this world is to get involved. Don't just be a participant on paper. So without further ado, this is my interview and session and bull, bull fest with the Liberal Gun Club. Enjoy. So this is the Liberal Gun Club, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia chapter. We are joined by Deviant Olam, Olav. Did I pronounce that correctly? That's all right. It's kind of a John Garand thing with my name. It's no, no one gets it right. It's a little shibboleth of mine. No, it is Olaf. You got it the second time. Olaf. Okay. So I'm being. We're joined by Deviant Olaf, who is a IT security expert, physical security expert, and a uh, proponent of Gun Culture 2.0. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you to everyone for. Uh, there's so many cool faces to see on the stream, and uh, many of you elsewhere watching the internet here in spirit, as it were. So, 
Yeah, this has been a real hoot for me. I must say, I didn't know about the Liberal Gun Club uh, initially. You popped on my radar because one of my watchers and fans had reached out and they said, hey, you know, I really just appreciate this various content you put out in the world. And before we started, we were kind of BSing about how some people show their bosses some of my videos about my work. And it's, so this person just said, I don't know if you ever heard of Liberal Gun Club, but I want to gift you a membership. Uh, so my membership was initially on someone else's dime, but I plan on re-upping it next year because it's been, a really, uh, it's been a really cool place to see. I got to hang out a little bit in the Discord and the annual meeting, and occasionally I'll tune into Bench Doctor sessions and the like. So it's really marvelous to see a lot of a lot of different voices out there. That's that's really what gun culture, in my opinion, needs. If uh, you know, there's there's a lot of diversity in backgrounds on on this call and in the community, but not so much in age. I've noticed, and that you know, we don't get to determine what the future is. The youth get to determine the world they wish to inherit, and if we don't welcome a lot of new voices, that a lot of youth and a lot of the next generation, in my opinion, are going to see uh, a world that they don't want to have guns in it. And that's that's how culture goes away, by not being welcoming to the next generation. So that kind of movement and that kind of growth is really positive, and I think this organization is a big part of that. Uh, I, some, of, some of you were saying where you are. I heard a lot of Virginia kind of concentration in the geographics there. I'm sure not everybody. Uh, I'm initially from back east. My company still has a presence back east in Fredericksburg, in fact, so not far from you all. But I grew up in the greater Philadelphia region. Uh, I've kind of gone from West Philadelphia to, you know, Western Montana to West Seattle. It's like a Forrest Gump thing I got going on. I'll hit the water and turn around maybe. I don't know. Uh, honestly, I don't think I will. I think this is probably the Pacific Northwest. Is, I miss the East Coast some days, but this is the best place I've ever lived. And it's it's an eclectic mix of peoples out here. There's a lot, a lot of different voices, and a lot of people who you wouldn't expect are gun owners are gun owners and vice versa. Uh, my wife and I both also come from military families. Uh, she and I have not served personally, but all of our families have. Her parents have. My dad did. So I just grew up with guns. I grew up shooting since I was little. Um, owning things like air rifles and 22s. And the moment I lived on my own, I got to purchase things and kind of haven't stopped. There was a while back there when wiser people than me said things like, well, you know, the two most addictive things in life that you start paying for are guns and tattoos. Once you start, you can't stop. So I had a rule for myself for a while that when I, I turned, you know, hit, hit 18 and I bought a gun. And then I said, all right, I'm going to once I get one per year. And I can either choose a tattoo or a gun on, on my birthday. And I am 40-something years old now, and I have one tattoo. And that, that rule went out the window anyway long ago. So, yeah, I've been collecting and shooting and introducing new people as much as possible. Um, my, you know, my wife and I, we go hunting sometimes. We actually met because of a hunting buddy of hers who is an RSO at an event I run. But... Uh, to get back into career and such, my, my wife and I are both in the technology sector. Again, there's a lot, a lot of representation um, of that in the Liberal Gun Club. I've been noticing people who have a tech or tech adjacent kind of job. Mine isn't uh, exactly IT sysadmin work. Um, many people think that, oh, you work at InfoSec. I'm like, well, like, I kind of work in information security. Uh, some of you already kind of know this. My my career is physical security uh, in the sense of security evaluations and physical security assessment of properties. My team, I run a covert entry team. We, we get paid to break into buildings and evaluate how we did it and write a whole report. It's, it's getting to be a dated reference at this point, but the old Roger Redford, Sidney Poitier film in uh, 1992 called Sneakers, uh, Late River Phoenix was in that, Dan Aykroyd was in that. That's, that's the closest analogy I ever have when someone says, what do you do? I'm like, well, I break into places to tell people who can break into their places. So there's a lot of talks online that I've given, and there's a lot of material out there about lock picking, about um, access control systems, RFID. Uh, some people know me for this talk I did called Elevator Hacking with a very smart cat named Howard Payne. And that's what brought me to the hacker community and the tech community. I've been attending a big, there's a lot of conferences everywhere that people go to in, in whatever field you're in. In the tech world, there's a multitude of small ones, but the big one that some of you have heard of maybe is called DEF CON. Uh, that's in Vegas every year or was until this year. 
I've been going to DEF CON for 20 years, and I run a number of things there. I run a number of cat, like games and contests, and I start help start up the Lockpick Village, which is a big hands-on lockpicking workshop area. And although I didn't start it, there was something called the DEF CON Shoot, and that was run by a guy named Chris, nice guy, when DEF CON was very, very small in its single-digit years, but it got to be too much for him to manage. It was a bunch of people. They were all friends. They were all in town. And they'd say, hey, let's go out and shoot in the desert because we can. And that was great. But they all got busy. And I said, you know, that DEF CON shoot thing, that's, we should keep that going. So I kind of took up the mantle of the DEF CON shoot. And that is one of my big events that I run every summer. And it used to be like we would rent a gun range and you bring a bunch of people to a gun range. But it's it's Nevada, right? You, there's a lot of BLM land outside of, uh, you know, Vegas in Clark County. So we just started picking a spot on the map. And I, it's kind of like if you, if you live in a city with a chef and that chef, they have like a pop-up restaurant off book somewhere. They'll like tweet. They're like, hey, me and a few buddies, we're doing this thing at this, you know, empty storefront. And for one weekend, there's like a restaurant there and then it's gone. Uh, that's kind of what the DEF CON shoot has been for years and years now. I would go to a party rental supply place and I would rent tent canopies and tables and chairs and I'd bring big pelican cases with eyes and ears and water and sunscreen and you name it. And it was like a pop-up gun range that it would exist at this one spot in the desert. We just tell people, everyone show up here and many people would drive or take a rental car. Sometimes someone would take a cab, take a cab like an hour outside of Vegas to the sound of gunfire. And the driver's like, where am I dropping you off? But yeah, in the middle of nowhere, just a gun range just would exist, and then it would disappear into the sagebrush. So that's something that I enjoy a lot. I, I believe that it's when you get a bunch of people together, those who aren't of the gun community don't know what they would expect. They, they expect, you know, hooting and hollering, Yosemite Sam, cowboy nonsense. But it's, what is the gun community? It's, it's your neighbors. The gun community is just people like yourself and other people that are good to know. Uh, I do a lot of collaboration because of this with many in the community. Uh, I, again, I'm I'm a nobody on YouTube. I'm on YouTube, but like my YouTube channel is a weird eclectic mix of sort of guns and sort of locks and food and drink things that I review with my wife. But in the gun community, I mean, many of you probably might watch Ian on Forgotten Weapons. Uh, he and his wife and my wife, we all hang out in, in Arizona. My buddy Carl is also, Carl has in-range TV, uh, so I hang out with him. James from TFB. I, I kind of pop up in weird places. I've, I've become kind of this weird character actor where people are watching something and they're like, hey, it's that guy. What's that guy doing here? I show up in comments on other people's videos and they're like, how do you, what technology connections? How do you know Alec? I'm like, oh, I know people. But it's neat. It's neat to see where life takes you. It's neat to see the, again, like I believe in building communities. I believe in building um, like Anything you have in your head, anything that you think is a neat idea for a project, uh, honestly, my favorite thing about being so involved with others and putting videos out is that once I commit to it, once there's like this weird expectation, some people don't like expectations. They're like, oh, I feel like I'm on deadline. I love that as like a forcing function to make me get things done. Uh, like Carl's channel, like in range. I have this idea that I had in my head for a long time for building a retro rifle. Um, I mean, like Brownell sells retro rifles now, like a, a retro's in these days, right? But I wanted as true as I could to recreate a very early style AR-15. I had an old upper uh, that I bought at a, you know an auction long ago, and it looked almost, it was something was up with it for a while. Like this is, why is this gas sink, gas is like a rifle length gas, system, but it's a short barrel, you know, I was like, is this a six? I don't know if it's an original 605, but it, it deserved more than just being mated up with a standard modern Colt lower, you know? So I said, I'm going to build a, a lower, but I wanted to build it from an 80%, like from the ground up. Cause I wanted to do, and I did all the artwork and I engraved the original Colt roll marks. Um, oh, speaking of community, like I get down to Texas, a whole bunch outside of Austin defense distributed, I'm friends with Cody and Paloma and Andres and all the crew at, at uh, who make the Ghost Gunner. So, I mean, I've got a GG unit. I milled everything out. I can, and I've been shooting video for Carl that he can put on his channel. But um, I like, it was a challenge because like, we're all busy. But I like anything that makes me get something out the door. Just 
get it out the door, stop bitching about it. And then other people who like ping on comments and reach out via email and people before we started this talk here, people like, hey, I really love that thing you did. And I showed it to my company. That's that's what I want. I want to just get this barely half formed idea, get it the frig out of my head into the world and then seeing other people pick that up and run with it again. That's that's how society like moves the ball down the field. So being involved with these communities, being involved with different groups, uh, seeing, again, like, the reason the DEF CON shoot is dear to me is a lot of people say it's one of the more welcoming events that they've ever come across. Uh, people who don't look like me, quite frankly, uh, reach out and they say, yeah, like, the whole gun community, I, all I see is, like, Blue Lives Matter flags and a bunch of, like, you know, Trump garbage at ranges. Like, I don't know, but you seem okay. Can I ask you about gun stuff? So now I routinely run a sort of intro to, you won't call it intro to firearms, because everyone knows there's a billion intro to firearms talks that are out there, right? But I kind of compare it to people who are just coming to the gun culture now, especially if they're LGBTQIA, if they're an underrepresented minority. It's almost like you're at a new school, and that first day in the cafeteria, and you're looking around like, where do I sit? I don't want to be an idiot. I don't want to make a bad impression. So this intro talk that I've been giving to a lot of folk has has a lot of not just technical, like here's some technical wisdom, but it's little cultural bits of wisdom. Understanding like little things like, yes, 556 five, versus 223. Uh, no, like the, the simple answer is no, they're obviously not the same thing. They have two different names. The slightly technical answer is, well, they're basically the same thing because even though they're very simple, and like the super technical answer is a small portion of people know the very fine details of why they're not the same and they will be very serious about it. So I try to, it's a lot of little bits of knowledge like that that I give to people when they're, they want to set foot into this world and not feel like they're completely out of place. And groups like Liberal Gun Club being welcoming to new people and saying, no, 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 you're not out of place. You have a place here. Uh, things like for the LGBTQ side, like armed equality, if, you, if anyone doesn't follow armed equality. And um, like Latino Rifle Organization. Oh, my gosh, Latino Rifle. Uh, we had a few people from uh, African American Gun Association, right? So things that Philip Smith has done there, just anything we can do to bring more voices in um, dare I get political and like, I'm not personally, like I have friends who are socialist rifle association. It's a little bit fiery, I think in some of their memes, but like anything that gets more people into, into this community is fine with me. John Brown gun club is another one that some people will say anybody who's slightly to the right of Trump is like, you are killing the community. No, I want to see these voices in our community. Uh, I want to see more ideas and more, more content and, Ultimately, that, that brings me back to why this culture shift has to happen. Otherwise, the community just ages out because all of the, the, the youth of today who, and we can get into why I think, you know, in the Q&A, like a lot of this is, I don't, I'm not the guy who blames the media for everything, right? But the, the media has portrayed gun violence as worse than it is. We all mostly on this Zoom know that gun violence is trending downward in America, but youth today who have grown up with school shooter drills and aren't really going shooting as much as we might have gone shooting, like, they inherit, they're inheriting the world. And they are, many of them, very politically fired up and very, very not welcoming to guns. And the, the next generation gets to decide the world they wish to inherit. And unless they are informed of our community and welcome in this community, they will gladly turn away from this community. And that is our fault. That is squarely our fault if we are not opening our doors to them before they've already set, set their minds in stone and uh, passing laws that we wouldn't like. So that's that. I don't know if that was a heavy bit of whatnot or if that was a happy way of, of kicking this all off. But I really do like, um, it's funny, I hadn't read this. Again, I just recently learned this past year of Liberal Gun Club, but I love the content on the site, speaking to things like when people used to ask me, they're like, you're a Mr. Gun guy. What is your solution for gun violence in America? And I'm like, I don't know, like universal health care, universal basic income, housing accessibility, like take your pick. Like any of those are going to do way more than an assault weapons ban. You know, how many gun crimes are domestic partner violence? Give a person an abusive relationship a way to get the F out of the house and go somewhere safe, which we don't <laughs> like those are solutions. So 
when I read the LGC's website speaking to broader societal problems that gun violence and any kind of violence are just really a symptom of broader problems that we can face uh, in a much less interventionist way than things like bans and registries and a lot of pinpoint acute measures that really don't treat anything but minor edge symptoms of a larger issue. I loved it. I love the text. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm really thrilled to get to meet all of you. So as like a uh, Gen X millennial cusp, early 80s mm -hmm. guy, there's stuff that I know I've missed the boat on. I saw TikTok show up, and I'm like, I'm never going to touch that. And then, and then at the same time, I'm thinking, well, that's where all the kids are. So how do I, as like a 40-year-old dude, go, hello, fellow kids on TikTok and get this next generation? Now, I'm aware that there's, you know, like, it's some number of edgy teens are all over, like, Reddit and 4chan, but they're already the kind of people who are going to wind up into guns anyway. Mm -hmm. Like, the, 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 the kids that... The kids who are, are already in the wide mouth of the funnel into gun culture... They're going to need, we're going to need to like rehabilitate them from being, you know, hardcore, you know, edgelords in their youth into mm -hmm. fully fledged reasonable adults. But, you know, everyone goes through that, right? Um, how do we get to the people who are college aged and younger right now who are using platforms that are, uh, that we've aged out of? who are in a youth culture that we've aged out of and who have grown up with, uh, you know, our generation's equivalent of duck and cover. That's hard, man, because I'm, you know, I'm right there with you in that I'm 42 now, man. I, I didn't think TikTok was anything except the occasional funny video that someone sends to me. And I'm, I don't even know, there's like TikTok dances. That's a thing. That's apparently there are well-known dances. So yeah, you got me scratching my my coconut as well. I definitely think there is a certain. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, I. What you said about the gun culture funnel is fascinating. Um, given my own experiences now, do you need to finish your thought and then I'll jump in with mine? My only thought tends to be, and it's it's frankly a very similar model, culturally to how any we'll call it broadly, I'll just say stigmatized group, becomes accepted. And that, that only comes through normalized, normalizing exposure. There was a time when anyone who was gay was in the closet because otherwise, you know, you wouldn't talk about that at work. You wouldn't talk about that at dinner. But eventually just through enough, oh yeah, like, you know, that's, that's Frank, that's Susan. Th th those people are gay. Being able to just say something in passing um, look at what look at what cannabis decriminalization movements have done over the years. You you can't as you know the equivalent of like the the Tommy Chong stoner is Mister Gun Range Gun Stickers on the truck. Like that person, everyone's like, oh, I I know who that person is. No, it was only when doctors and lawyers at you know respectable. We don't want to play the respectability game. Respectable, acceptable in when in group members who are respected were like. No, actually, cannabis is fine, really. That other people who would, like, hush-hush the topic go, wait, what? Well, if Philip, the neurosurgeon, says cannabis is fine, maybe I'm all turned around on this issue. So it's, it's not about being the most extreme vo voice in, the, in a community. It's making sure that just average friendly voices in any community are representing a viewpoint that matters to you. And... As far as firearms, yeah, I really like what you said. The the edge lords and such who are like, I got my guns. People are just like, oh god, you you also are DMing them inappropriately to women on Twitter. Like, don't 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 be that guy. We just need regular average people who aren't extreme in their views, who just make guns part of a conversation. Like, it's the most normal. It's why I gave a talk years ago about flying with firearms, um, and it's be, it's been reshared, and I wrote about it on the firearm blog. Many times I would fly with a firearm. In fact, I always, whenever I fly, there's a gun in my bag unless I'm going to a non-gun friendly country uh, because I get to A, like lock my luggage. That's my physical security hat that I'm wearing. But also I just like normalizing those interactions. I like normalizing the idea that I'm at an airport in wherever 
and the family checking in behind me for their family vacation sees a guy like, oh, he has guns in his luggage, and he's like clear and make safe and put the gun down and, okay, deal with the ticket agent. Uh, just sort of normalizing the, the topic as opposed to extreme, extremizing. Is that, that's not a verb. Extremizing the topic. You were saying, though, please. Yes. What you said is very interesting because I grew up in a household where guns weren't a thing, where my mom agonized over allowing me and my sister to own water guns. Yes, that was a thing. And uh, look how I turned out. Like, I have a couple of friends who I've told, oh, yeah, I own firearms. Not, you know, it was in the conversation. And they're like, I had no idea. You're not the type to. Um, that was a win. Mm -hmm. And I also want to point out, you're talking about extreme sounding versus extreme. Because to a lot of people, my views are fairly extreme. Like, I want to, like, I want to end the 86 ban on machine guns. Mm hmm I think silencers should be sold over the counter. No background check. I, I think they probably should be serialized for the purposes of manufacturer tracking, but that's it. Mm -hmm. um, but to a lot of people, that's, you know, high gun nuttery. Mm -hmm. But I then point out, well, what is the basis? I flip it out. What is, what is the basis for your desire to restrict the item? And is it a reasonable basis? Right. Um, the media, I don't think, is our is completely our fault. Because how many people in New York City own firearms? The media, ca the media capital of America. How many of them own firearms? How I don't likely? Know. It it rounds to zero. Okay. It rounds to zero. It's 20,000 people, but in a population of 8 million, it rounds to zero. Mm -hmm. So what is the likelihood that they're going to have a firearms experience that isn't a police officer or a criminal in New York City? Mm -hmm. And the answer is approximately zero. It's probably true. So if I want to fix gun culture in America, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pray that the FPC does a, does a number on New York City's Sullivan Act. That is the Fire and Policy Coalition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Managages to force for people viewing this later or people who don't know the very weaken the very restrictive laws in New York City. Because the moment that that happens, instead of 20,000 we're talking about maybe a hundred thousand. And then these are normal people who have normal jobs and normal families and normal cars without stickers on them. And things start to move. Do you think that mere ownership in a metropolitan area that big is enough or are they going to enforce zoning that prevents uh, gun ranges. Those of us, so we were speaking, I guess John and I were speaking just before the start about Philadelphia. Philadelphia being a very unique, um, you know, it's, it used to be the, the fourth largest city. And now I think it's the fifth or sixth because of Houston and maybe one other. Um, but like Philly still has in the metropolitan area, gun ranges. Uh, Yuri and his wife, uh, Yuri Zeltzman, I think still has his spot on like 9th Street uh, up by Spring Garden. And that's unheard of in most major metropolitan areas that there might be gun owners, but like, where do they go shoot? And in New York, you have people, there are so many links to that, how it would be interesting. Would, would MTA have a policy that bans, you know, firearms? Because that's something that New York's got a big enough cudgel they could just do. I could imagine so many weird disruptions that I definitely hope that FPC moves the ball, but it's... Yeah, how many of those just become guns in, you know, closets? I yeah, don't know. So the interesting thing is, um, when I when I lived in South Philly, there were two gun ranges within walking distance of my house. Like I could just go for a stroll and stop by the range. Mm -hmm. However, the zoning issue, and I remember when when I remember when Yuri bought that range from the people who had previously screwed mm -hmm. up. Yeah. Um, and the zoning was an enormous fight. He was able to reopen the range, and then when he wanted to 
uh, get an FFL in there too. That was a whole issue. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that you could open a brand new range. I think you just kind of have to perpetuate the, the, the the locations that are grandfathered in. Right. For example, here in, in, um, the twin cities area, if you do a Google search for gun range, you'll find that they all start cropping up the instant you're outside of the metropolitan area where they can't get zoned out of business anymore. Mm -hmm. So, you know, something like New York, I'm almost certain that the fight, the fight for normalcy is going to start with the battles over whether or not you can open a range, whether or not you can sell guns. Are you too close to a school? Is there, is there a school actually every thousand yards in New York, you know, mm-hmm. like if, if you were to draw a uh, thousand yard radius around every location that you could conceivably prohibit a gun shop from, does that turn into a blanket ban? Mm-hmm. You know, I um, can speak to DC, which went out of their way to be as difficult as humanly possible without having the federal courts club them over the head. Can I say that? I, I think I can. Uh, yeah. Because federal courts can club municipalities into compl- into submission, and they, they know it and they get along with the program. And what ended up happening is the FFL the one FFL holder in DC rented a space in the police station because that was the only place that they could get space. And then now then that FFL holder said, you know, there's there's too much going on. I've had it. I'm out. DC was like, we don't know what to do. We don't want to get sued again. Um, so now the police want to be an FFL, which raises a whole other set of privacy concerns um, for obvious reasons. Also, I would like to very, very quickly welcome Lara Smith to the call, our national Hello. spokesperson. Hello. And uh, thank you for joining us and and talking to the club. I'm out here in California, so it's kind of mid-afternoon for me, and I just got back from two range days, so my apologies for hopping in late. No problem. I I can tell everybody on the call, too, it's not just the city zoning out. It's not just that. Um, I I don't know if you know Rhonda Azell. She's the woman who was the plaintiff in um, Azell versus Chicago, which was the the case about whether you can have guns in Chicago and, and whether there could be stores and, and th- there's a whole range of stuff uh, uh, involved in that. But Rhonda can't get anybody in the industry interested in building a range in Chicago because of the pricing. Mm-hmm. And and it's not the pricing of the zoning fight. It's the pricing of the oh, land. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, the guns are normal thing. Yeah. But, but that's something else we're gonna have to talk about with the younger generation is the cost of this. It's yeah. not cheap. I mean, I went and shot 500 rounds yesterday and the class was 500 bucks. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and that was a, it was a training class that really, honestly, everybody should have to take if you're going to carry, you know, it was an advanced carry class. We've got to talk about, you know, part of it is making guns normal. It helps to have me, um, the 40 something soccer mom, you know, um, it helps to have David Umane at, um, Wake Forest, who's the sociologist about guns. Yeah. Um, it helps to have you. It helps to have John and Sarah. It helps to have, um, you know, all these voices. But if we're going to talk about making it normal, we also need to make sure that it's normal for the 20 somethings that are coming in to talk about it. And we need to be realistic on the fact that for a lot of these kids, God, especially now, I mean, I'm just lucky, you know, I mean, the past eight months, my husband and I, my husband lost his job, but we were okay. Cause I have a good job mm-hmm. and he got a new job. You know, I'm financially sound, but 20 somethings aren't right. This is doing a number on them. And so for those of us who were the generation are really two now up, we've got to talk about that and we've got to stop the gear I bought a Keltec sub, whatever I bought a, you know, I bought a, this, I bought a, that I bought a, Oh, you can't have a high point. That's a piece of garbage. Well, that's what you can afford. Oh, you can't buy that safe. You can bypass that safe. Well, hell it's better if you have a young kid in the house than no safe. Mm -hmm. You know, we have got to stop the gear shaming and, and I mean, yeah, everybody wants to be a gearhead. That's totally not my thing, by the way, if you read my stuff, I'm not the gearhead. I don't care. (laughs) Like that is, 
is not my interest in this at all. I am, I am, I like to shoot, but really my thing is like the, the, I like the politics side. Mm -hmm. That's kind of my interest in this. Um, but I, I, I think that's a big thing. And so I think it's great to have people like you coming in and saying, Hey, like check this out, but I'd love to see, and, and maybe that's something, you know, that, that everybody in this industry, we should be talking about, about doing content for, well, what if you can't buy the Daniel defense AR? You know? Right. What if you don't have that? What if you're 20? What if you live with mom and dad? Mm -hmm. You're not going to be going out and buying an AR to stick in your closet. God, I hope not. Go get the handgun and get the handgun safe. You mm -hmm. know, like, that is stuff that I think you know, talking about making content, you know, I'd love to see more of that, but I'd, I'd love to hear kind of your take on the industry's over-reliance and the next cool, expensive toy. I think, so these are joined um, forces, right? When we talk about how much of the culture is a monolith, it's not just that the traditional firearms community looks like middle-aged white guys, Historically in America, that's also a group of the populace with a ton of discretionary income. So you get this kind of, well, I want the whiz-bang shiny because it's a bunch of people with discretionary income doing the talking and driving. Dri like, I go to SHOT Show every year. I film for Carl and Ian on the floor, right? And it's all the latest, greatest, most expensive, whammo dine, you know, asteroid whatever thing. Um <laughs> I, I really, it, it's going hand in hand with changing the conversation. I should have mentioned earlier, seeing any uh, individuals, the next generation, her name is Tactical Girlfriend. Um, someone who is not a middle-aged white guy, who is showing like this sort of hard scrabble, almost punky DIY element, um, her rifle and pistol build, her, her rig. These are all things that she sort of fabric cobbled together. And, you know, I really love the moment where she wanted to, you know, enhance her rifle. So she's literally like rattle canning her rifle using like, you know, if you would be in gym class, the bag, the kickballs are stored in like the mesh bag. She's using mesh bag as a little screen thing and using ferns on the and just and they're like, look at this done almost like it belongs published in a zine or something. So, yes, the I, I really like the point you're making, the economic barrier and the point that so many people do love to gear shame is huge. It's absolutely big. And uh, I don't just worshiping at the altar of the latest and greatest is what you see everywhere at the industry shows, because the industry knows that's where their money is going to come from. It's going to come from a bunch of people with too much to spend who want to buy like, oh, wow, like, look at look at H uh, K re-releasing the MP5 now. Like. Hi. Why? No one needs this. It's a beautiful firearm. I, lo I love the roller delayed system. It's wonderful. But no one needs that. But they knew that it would sell. And it is selling to people who are like me and older because they're like, I want that one. I can speak to this a little bit because of how I budget. What I do is, and this is just my own experience with it is I will buy something and then I will buy stuff for it mm -hmm. over the next few months because well you know in real life when you don't want to use you know you don't want to ever have credit card debt you um you realize this month I can do that but next month I've got a I've got a bill coming in the month after that I got you know I got a you know there's a car repair there's a you know, there's the property tax bill. So, mm -hmm. you know, it takes, you know, months. And that's what I do. Other people do it other ways. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, and at least for me, like the one, fire, the one firearm that I get the most comments on is an old SIG. And I think that's really interesting. It's not the newest, coolest whiz bang. It's nineteen. It's late seventies tech. Mm -hmm. Do and you th I think that says something? Do you think that there has been something lost in a lot of gun orgs? Used to be very sporting and competitive focused, and that has fallen yeah. away. 
yeah. the fact that nowadays everything, everything is, and we'll get into this kind of language. There's a lot of othering language that gets on, right? Even when we talk about in the gun community itself, solving gun problems, solving gun violence, everyone loves their distancing languages, doing a lot of work. You know, we'll drop in, we'll drop in phrases like mental health, which, you know, parentheses, meaning, well, my mental health is sound. It's those other people that should get help, let alone mental health shaming and no health care. Or gangs, we'll drop in the word gangs, which do- does tons of heavy lifting, meaning those people in those communities over there who are like causing trouble. Um, that's been a mainstay of like racist dialogue for a long time. Thanks. Yeah. So the idea that defense is now the whole crux of what everyone's, you have the best defense. It all just means to be afraid of your neighbors. The fact that sporting and competition has declined, people nowadays don't even factor in the idea that many times they're buying a gun. You can't outshoot your gun most of the time, even with an average gun. But people need to have, like, oh, I need to have that, like, BCM, Daniel Defense Upper, like, why? Well, it's, you know, it's half an MOA more accurate, and even under hot barrel conditions when you dump mags. See my previous question, why? What is, what is your use condition? And no one is really evaluating themselves as a, as a metric, which that, when I grew up, my dad and I would do slow fire, bring the target in, like, Sharpie marker, making the boxes and send it back down. And I had a reason to care about the lead I was sending down range. Nowadays, it feels more like people care about their guns for the scenario that will never happen, not the one that they actually have, which is maybe I can improve myself in some way. Um, It's one of the reasons I love uh, what Carl and other people have been doing with, you know, two gun and other things that make challenging courses of fire practical and fun and not uh, fuddy-duddy old-timey. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Again, meeting people who are not your average gun owner, uh, especially if you yourself are not your average gun owner, that's a great thing. There's a lot of gun content out on the internet and much of it can make unconventional types of folk feel really alienated or disconnected from the gun community. But I'm really happy when people are not that sort of just derpy doofus chud kind of channel. Uh, If you're not familiar, I mean, there's a lot out there, right? Like even mainstream gun channels, some of them are really great. Some of them are not off-putting no matter what stripe of life you come from. Uh, Many people know I'm friendly with and have written for the Firearm blog, right? TFB TV, like the wonderful gun shorts, James Reeves, and you got Miles and Hop and all the other people who are on there. Like not a one of them is is a chuddy douchebag. They're all, you know, they would all call themselves different kinds of douchebags. No, they're really sweet dudes. Like every one of those folk is just open, welcoming, and wonderful. Uh, You have other creators like Tactical Girlfriend. You have the Gun Penguin. You have people who are trying to elevate and center other voices and bring new faces into this dialogue, right? Like, look at David Yamane, uh, the professor, right, down at Wake Forest. The the whole movement called Gun Culture 2.0 that he has had for years now. Uh, Just, it's really cool to see different ways of framing the discussion. Uh, It's really cool to see, for example, like really, like if you think that you don't have a voice in this community, you are dead ass wrong. Uh, If all the people I'm mentioning are not like lefty or radical enough for you, like look at Mitch and Dirt, who've got the Red Dot District podcast, right? Armed Margins, if you're not, you know, if you're not aware of Armed Margins, again, the gun community is not a monolith. It does not all look like you think it looks. So by all means, uh, just reach out to folk like that. Reach out to other people that you can bond with, follow different kinds of creators, uh, all the ones I've listed and more, not least of which I will always plug and mention uh, my very good friend Carl of InRange TV and all the people that Carl collaborates with on the reg because they are, they are all representing a lot of different voices and your voice matters too. Your voice is part of this community, your voice belongs, and if you've ever felt like an outsider in this world, you don't have to feel like an outsider at the firing line, all right? I hope to see you wherever you go. I hope to see you at the range. I hope to see you on that internet. Most of all, I hope that you stay safe out there. Well, all right, some of you stuck around. Why? Because I'm doing giveaways. Absolutely, you know, the prize pelican has come back. 
Uh, if you're not familiar with this, watch one of my previous videos where I said the return of prizes. Uh, what it is, I have a little mailing list. I don't really send out mail. I just use it in case I ever anger the YouTube gods one day for talking about things like this. But if you are on the mailing list, uh, link down below, you can get entered into a random drawing all the time whenever I feel like giving stuff away. And I've got a lot of shit to give away. Speaking of, this this has been in the box for a while. It's, it's taken up a lot of room. What is this little device? This thing called the Kedox. Uh, this is a media player. This is, it takes SD cards, USBs, it'll pipe out to HDMI uh, or other multi-cables. This is something we once used, well, we've used it up in the cabin before when we have no internet, we're completely off, you know, off everything up there. But if you want to hook up to, you know, a TV, it even has a little freaking like remote control in that whole jam. But yeah, the idea is, I think, do I have a, do I have a flash drive in here? I do. Wow. I don't know how much freaking content is on this flash drive. It's like a, is a terabit drive? No. All right. It's, it's pretty big. There's a lot of media on there, old episodes of Futurama and The Simpsons and a ton of movies. But if you would like that, if you, if you have an off the grid kind of living situation, or maybe you, uh, like we did one time, had someone who was in pretrial detention and they were not allowed to access the internet. Do you know how freaking hard it is to watch any kind of content if you're not allowed to access the internet? Kedox comes into play, man. It saves the day. So if you would like that, and I will throw in uh, I'll throw in some patches and stuff as well. Uh, just stuff from SHOT Show. What is, oh my God. The crud, the, this is like pre, this is spooky. Pre-corona crud patch. Uh, yeah, and some Optics Planet patches and things. I will throw all that together for you. If you are entered in uh, to, to randomly be drawn, it's on the mailing list below. I'll wait a day after this video goes up. You can scramble to tippy type your informations into that internet machine. Remember, I don't need your real information where you live. I just need to know where I can ship you something. So if you win, I will shove this in a box and into the mail. I will email you and let you know. Good luck. Thank you for watching. Thank you for enjoying this uh, crazy shenanigan world that is my YouTube channel. No gods, no masters, no corporate overlords, no sponsorship at all. No, I don't care if you like, subscribe, or hit the bell. I don't care if you want to give me money because you can't because I don't have a Patreon. This is just for fun. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that one day if I retire, but uh, for now, I just do it for the smiles that y'all give me online. So give me a hearty thumbs up, not, you know, for the algorithm, just like thumbs up me on Twitter or, or Instagram or something else. Fuck you. Fuck, yeah, I don't I fuck care about the algorithm. You keep finding me somehow, so we'll keep this train going even without any gas in the diesel tank. Stay safe out there. So you have the Second Amendment Foundation, right? Like they're an incredible policy directive action group. They, uh, the, the, the.